The academic world has been the source of a number of distinguished appointments in government in recent years. One of the most outstanding of these was the appointment of Nicholas Katzenbach to the Justice Department from the law faculty of the University of Chicago. He brings to the office of Acting Attorney General of the United States a record of leadership and achievement uh, stretching back at least to undergraduate days at Princeton through a law degree at Yale and further education at Oxford. Uh, he was no stranger to government service. He'd served as counsel to the Air Force and consultant to the Secretary of the Air Force. Among his subjects when he was last on the academic active list were contracts, international law, and legislation. Uh, no doubt today his interests and duties encompass an even broader area of legal problems. It's a pleasure to present the Attorney General of the United States, Nicholas Katzenbach. Thank you, Dean Maxwell. Among the subjects that I've been teaching recently has been constitutional law, which I've been teaching at some of the southern universities. <laughs> I ought to say to you, quite frankly, that uh, uh, this welcome is somewhat uh, less exuberant than that which I got at the University of Mississippi. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, but at least uh, there was nobody standing in the doorway when I arrived here at the Student Union. But apart from that, the, there is a parallel because uh, I not only talked about constitutional law, but I talked a little bit about civil rights when I was at the University of Alabama. At that time, I didn't really have a choice of subject. Uh, but uh, today I do, and I choose it consciously because I really do believe that we have turned an important corner in this country in the past three and a half years in the long search for equal rights for all citizens. Because after really decades of somewhat fitful struggle, I think it has become clear now that the full force and will of the federal government is and is going to continue to be behind those pledges of equal justice and equal opportunity which we have mouthed uh, but not always lived. And we now have laws dealing with really every form of official discrimination and compulsory segregation. The American public and Congress have decided that it is no longer permissible to take one example, for a lunch counter to agree to serve Negroes, then require them to drink Pepsi-Cola instead of Coca-Cola, stand rather than sit, and to drink from a paper cup rather than a glass, and finally to pay seven cents rather than five for that privilege. Public and Congress have decided that it's no longer tolerable for there to be more motels willing between Washington and Miami willing to accept travelers with dogs then there are motels willing to accept travelers who happen to be Negroes. And the public and Congress have decided that it's no longer permissible to exclude Negroes from libraries or schools or voting booths or the other aspects of citizenship because of race. And in short, because of the accomplishments in the field of official discrimination, the systematic overt deprivation of rights I think that that form of discrimination is, if it isn't now dead, that at least is dying, and I don't even think the throes of death are going to be too long or too convulsive. I don't mean to sound sanguine about this. I don't underestimate the difficulties lie ahead in enforcing legal guarantees of equal rights. Further acts of white terrorism and Negro anguish, which we're going to have to cope with, which we're coping with now, we're going to have to cope with for some time. But what I am saying is that I think that the principle has now been established, and it's been established in a way which 
makes it clear that it isn't simply a principle to be talked about, but also one that is going to be acted upon. And so that system of state and official supported segregation is not merely now illegal, as it has always been since the 14th Amendment, but that something is going to be done about it and that the end is in sight. And because of these advances, it seems to me now appropriate that we turn our attention to far more fundamental concerns. Heretofore, we've really been concerned over the plight of Negroes because they are Negroes. In fact, the very phrase civil rights has in recent years become popularly used simply to signify really Negro rights. And it seems to me now we have to broaden that concern. We ought to be concerned over the plight of Americans, whether they're Negro or white, who are forced to live in, in slums. We have to be concerned with adequate education for all children, Negro or white, and be concerned with full employment for everyone, Negro or white. So the test of our future in civil rights is not now, today, it seems to me, how compassionately we treat some, immigrant, neg some Americans because they happen to be Negroes. The test is really how well we can respond to the problems of Negroes and whites because they're Americans. And that's why I think we've, uh, and I say that we've turned a corner in our civil rights history, because we've reached the point today where we can begin to focus on the basic problems of human dignity and human living, which are common to all of us. And to understand how sharp a corner that is, I'd like to just look back over the last three and a half years and see how wide the sweep of compulsory racial segregation really was. Take, for example, the area of voting rights. There's nothing more fundamental than that. Yet in January of 61, when I went with the Department of Justice, there was a widespread denial of this in most southern states. And up to that time, there's only been 10 suits brought under the civil rights legislation, none of them in Mississippi. Total now has swelled to 67 lawsuits, 24 of them in Mississippi. And voting records have been analyzed in another 130 southern counties, and voting inspection has taken place in another 40 counties. Now, each one of these voting cases involves an immense, really, statistical and legal preparation. You have to examine literally hundreds and thousands of pieces of paper where people have attempted to register to vote in order to make a case which will show a pattern or practice of discrimination. Yet the effort has brought results. One dramatic example would be Macon County, Alabama. 1960, it was almost impossible for a Negro to vote in that county. Last month, in the wake of a federal voting action, two Negroes were elected to the county council, the first members of their race to hold such office in Alabama since Reconstruction. There's a numerous other examples involving election of Negroes, moderate whites, whites as a result of increased Negro suffrage. Maybe just to, to suffice it to say that in the past 30 months, over 600,000 Negro voters have been added to the rolls in southern states, which is an increase of almost 30 percent, and I would expect a similar increase in the next 30 months. The second right, which was equally basic, was the right to travel anywhere in the country without interference. The Freedom Riders of May of 1961 dramatically helped to demonstrate that segregation in bus and rail and air terminals existed throughout the South. Existed there despite the fact that it was clearly illegal. By the end of 1961, we had secured desegregation regulations from the Interstate Commerce Commission, 
brought a number of suits and by the end of 1962 all segregation in interstate transportation had been successfully eliminated. Third, in the area of education, schools in five states were still completely segregated at the end of 1960. And the Department of Justice under Mr. Kennedy made it plain soon after he became Attorney General that the federal government was not going to tolerate any interference with court orders. I think that was tremendously important, as tragic as the situation was at the University of Mississippi. It was tremendously important that that point was made and that it was driven home again in Governor Wallace at Tuscaloosa so that nobody had any doubt that these court orders were going to be enforced and they're going to be enforced whatever it took. And I think the fruits of that were felt this fall now there's at least some desegregation in every state and perhaps the most dramatic example was when three school districts in Mississippi peacefully desegregated this fall. The same can be said in terms of progress in the areas of employment by the President's Committee under President Johnson when he was Vice President on Equal Employment Opportunity. The same is true in the area of government service, where more than 50 appointments uh, were made, high appointments in President Kennedy's and Johnson's administration were Negroes, including Judge of the Court of Appeals and Mr. Robert Weaver, who's head of housing and home finance, uh, Cecil Poole, who's our U.S. attorney in San Francisco, four federal district uh, court judges, and so forth. And I think there's been extensive advances in the field of federal programs in terms of the administration of, in terms of acting against discrimination in housing and in hospitals built with federal funds. And I think probably the most significant advance of all came this summer after a full year of intensive effort by the administration and by public and private groups by congressional leaders of both parties with the enactment of the Civil Rights Act. Because until its enactment, the only federal civil rights laws passed since 1875 had dealt with voting. And under that act, for the first time, Congress spoke and outlawed segregation as an official way of life and as an official system. This wasn't just true in part, not just with respect to a seat on a bus or a, or a space at a polling place. It's outlawed in virtually every form that can be reached by law, whether at a lunch counter or at a library or in schools or nightclubs, federal programs or in the area of equal employment opportunity. <coughs> Now, as I said at the outset, there's one area of substantial concern within this official discrimination that remains, because there are, in some areas, as the wall of official segregation crumbles, the rabbit and the witless and the cruel seek to shore it up with acts of violence. And we've been seeing this throughout the summer but we've also seen right now a sharply accelerating number of arrests and prosecutions, both by the federal government and what I take to be highly significant by the state government as well. And that's going to continue until this kind of terrorism is eliminated. And I don't think that there is any governor in the South today who is willing to tolerate these acts of terrorism as a method of preserving the older way of life. And I don't think that for that reason, however they may feel on the issue of segregation and discrimination, that the drive for equal rights is going to be stopped by a bomb or a bullet or a burning cross. And now, with these legal principles established, the 
larger task, as I said at the outset, is to concentrate on the deeper nationwide problems which affect Negroes and whites. You can conquer official discrimination by laws and by lawsuits, but you can't by law and by lawsuits grant skills, job skills to the unskilled. And you can't give the slum dweller the means with which to buy a home. And law can't unaided conquer that helplessness which afflicts millions of Americans, whatever their color. And the problems of poverty really aren't racial problems. 80% of the poor families in this country are white. Poverty does strike hardest at the non-white families, the non-white population. Employment rights, employment rates for non-whites, for example, are twice as high as for whites. And about a million of our unemployed, 25% of the total, are non-whites. In Los Angeles here, the Negro population is growing at more than twice the rate of the white population. In the 1950s, it rose 112% compared with 46% for whites. And the last census here showed an unemployment rate among non-whites of almost 10%, nearly twice that of the whites. And that pattern of figures here in Los Angeles can be repeated in city after city all around the country. Now, the cause of those disparities isn't simply race. I think the problem is a lot more complicated than that. And let me give you an example. The highest unemployment rate in any census tract in Chicago in 1960 was 35%. That's seven times the national rate, which runs about 5%. That area was 97% Negro. But in the same city, in the same year, and in another census tract, which was 97% Negro, the unemployment rate was only 2%. And it seems to me the difference is plainly not race, but education. And the median educational level in the first district was about eight years, and in the second district was about 12 years. Even ensuring that students stay in school, only a partial answer, if the schools are of inferior quality. And they often are in non-white areas. In Harlem, for example, recent studies show that the average IQ drops 10 points between the third and the sixth grade. Now these are the kind of problems that seems to me lie ahead in the field of civil rights and therefore, the ultimate victories are really going to be won on many fronts. We've made it unlawful to deny, deny a man his civil rights on the basis of race. We can, we can and we will enforce that law. But in the years ahead, what we have to combat is the other forces that deny Americans the full measure of citizenship. Ill health, substandard housing, ignorance, poverty. And it's in these larger terms that the tax cut, for example, stimulated the economy and improved employment, and thus, in that sense, was an equal opportunity measure. The anti-poverty program of President Johnson's, in that sense, an equal opportunity law. And the Manpower Retraining Act and the Juvenile Delinquency Control Act and other such measures are, in that sense, all equal opportunity laws. They're, in that sense, all civil rights laws. And the same could be true of other pending legislation, such as medical care for the aged. All of these can be seen as efforts to ensure equal opportunity. So that's what I really think the future of the civil rights movement is. And it seems to me that from here on, the cause of civil rights and equal opportunity is only going to advance as America advances. It was a favorite saying that President Kennedy used to be fond of quoting, in which he said that a rising tide 
lifts all boats. And I think that's what the future of civil rights is going to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katzenbach. Now, if you will address questions directly to the Attorney General, he'll be glad to receive them from you. Uh, the question was, uh, if Proposition 14 is enacted, would there be any reaction in the southern states, and, and would they follow suit? Well, I, I think the first part of that is I don't know a southern state that has a Rumson Act, uh, so that in that sense they don't have the, uh, the same problem or presumed problem. Uh, I would guess that the southern states would all point to that should that come to pass as uh, an example that they were not alone in their views of the racial problem that really the people of California, uh, despite, uh, uh, really despite the facts, uh, felt the same way that they did and George Wallace would uh, smile, be happy. Yes. The questioner pointed to the acts of violence in the South and also to the fact that these acts were generally violations of state law rather than federal law, and that in the Medgar Evers case and in others there had been a lack of successful prosecution, and asked uh, whether in view of this, I think I'm accurately stating this, whether in view of this uh, uh, there was a room or need for more federal legislation uh, in this area. I am quite firmly persuaded that state authorities, as I said in my talk, are not going to tolerate shooting of the type that occurred uh, in uh, the uh, Medgar Evers case or in the case of the three civil rights workers in Mississippi or in the case of Colonel Penn. We've had no difficulty in terms of cooperation from state authorities in that respect. We have had difficulty of cooperation with some of the local sheriffs. The difficulty does not seem to me to be an absence of a federal law. One of the problems is securing conviction even on quite good evidence from 12 people in a jury. I have no quarrel with the way in which the alleged killer of uh, Medgar Evers, uh, DeLay Beckwith, uh, was tried. He was vigorously prosecuted. Witnesses did come forward. The evidence was in and the jury was hung. But if that, I don't think the federal government could have done any better on prosecution. In fact, I would be inclined to think had the federal government prosecuted it, there would be enough resentment against the federal government to have made it less likely rather than more likely uh, to have persuaded a, uh, a, uh, a jury in that. But I, I think that's a passing thing, and I'm not prepared to uh, say let's get rid of the jury system uh, at, uh, at this time. I didn't mean to imply that you suggested that we should either, uh, but that really is the problem within, uh, within these areas. Yes?
Yeah. Well, the, the question uh, uh, was, uh, the questioner pointed out that there had been uh, uh, several difficulties on civil rights workers involving uh, real dangers of, uh, to life and limb in the South this summer, and that upon occasion uh, they had called the uh, FBI, and the FBI had said that they couldn't take action until the crime had actually been committed and the speaker pointed out that that wouldn't be much help if you were lynched. Uh, there are a large number of FBI agents in the state of Mississippi. And there have been all summer and they remain there today. I think this has helped to, to cut down on the, the amount of uh, threats and crime and the dangers. It hasn't eliminated it. I don't think that the federal, the situation is clearly a dangerous one. And I assume, and the workers that went down there were told that it was. There was tremendous resentment on the part of people in Mississippi against the COFO workers. Uh, as I think any of them, if there's anybody here that was down there, will attest that that resentment was real and genuine and probably shared by 99% of the white population in, in Mississippi. Uh, not that only a few would engage in the kind of acts that uh, the speaker talked about. It's a very difficult proposition uh, for the federal government to be involved in the proposition of protecting uh, people. And uh, this really involves more authority and more personnel than we have. The, any citizen has a right of arrest, and for that reason, any, uh, any uh, agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, as a citizen, not as a federal agent, has a right of, of arrest any time that he sees a felony being committed in his presence. But when these calls would come in, the normal procedure that the, the uh, Bureau used would be to notify the local authorities. Now, the notification of the local authorities, particularly of the State Highway Patrol, makes sense. Uh, it makes sense for this reason. Whatever their views may be, or whatever the views of a local sheriff may be, if he's been put on notice by the federal government that something's happening here and there's a danger, it's a pretty uncomfortable position for a law enforcement official to be in. Now, he may go down the rest of the civil rights work, but he probably won't let the violence occur. Yes? I was asked to comment on my views, if I can shorten the question, with respect to school busing. Uh, that is, uh, getting uh, integration by the pro proposition of uh, taking students from one neighborhood into others, and vice versa. I think the interesting thing about this problem is that the Negro parents and the white parents are reacting in the same way and for exactly the same reasons. The Negro parents who have suggested that, or demanded, or insisted upon, or urged, or however you want to put it, that students be bused from one school to another have as their objective trying to get 
decent education within the area in which they live so that they can see their children decently educated. I think the white parents that have protested the transfer of their children into these schools have, are saying they don't want their children into those schools because they're inferior schools. So I think the motivation in each case is exactly the same. They don't want their children educated in inferior schools and they want something done about it. Now, I don't think the solution to education is busing. As an educational matter, it doesn't really make much sense to me and I doubt very much that it makes much sense to the, any of the people urging it or opposing it. But what does make sense to them is somehow or other something be done about these schools. And if the only way, I think the attitude of the Negro parents would be, if the only way that we can get a better education for our children is to get some white children into this school and have enough public attention concentrated on it so something will be done about the education, then that's what we're for. And I must say, if I were a, a uh, living in that community and the parent of children in that community, I would have exactly the same views. But I think busing is political in, that, in the sense that it is designed to focus attention on doing something about education in those schools. And uh, that as an educational matter, uh, uh, rather than uh, as a device for improving education by getting more attention on it, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. Yes? I was uh, asked whether, because of the provision in the Civil Rights Act with respect to cutting off funds where federal funds are used by states in a discriminatory manner, uh, whether if Proposition 14 uh, were to be enacted, uh, whether the federal government would then cut off uh, aid to housing or such things in the state of California as a result. Uh, I would, I'd love to say yes and persuade everybody in California to vote the other way on Proposition 14, which I would do if I were a Californian, but, I doubt that Proposition 14, as I understand it, and I must say it's difficult for anybody to understand it, uh, as I understand it, I doubt that it would actually get the state involved in a positive program of, of uh, discrimination. And I suppose in the absence of the state being involved in that way, uh, federal funds would not be cut off. I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that one could hypothesize facts in which this might, might uh, create a problem, but I think they would probably uh, be pretty far-fetched. Yes? The, the question was, and I have a lot of sympathy with it, we talked about poverty for all Americans and what's being done about the most impoverished uh, group of all uh, the American Indians. Uh, I think a lot more ought to be done. I can only answer that in this kind of way, to say that for the last three and a half years in the Department of Justice, it seemed to me every time I put my head in Mr. Kennedy's office, he said, why can't we get more of those Indian claims settled because they need the money and uh, it will go to a good purpose. And uh, we did. Uh, we got a lot of, and there was a lot of money available, not nearly enough, but a lot of money available there in the, out of the Indian claims program, uh, which can be used by the various tribal uh, uh, councils. Beyond that, my own real lack of knowledge as to what the Department of Interior is doing, uh, and this really prevents me from 
giving you a, a good answer. I'm sorry. I'm just ignorant. Yes? The, the question was that, well, Negroes were the best organized, and I mentioned Negroes. Uh, what about the Mexicans, where the segregation was parts of this country as intense uh, as, uh, as it is with respect to the Negroes? And my, my answer to that would be that as, as far as the... I think there's very little in the way of official segregation with respect to the Mexican population. And so far as there is, the, the Civil Rights Act would cover that uh, just as it covers the uh, segregation with respect to Negroes. As far as other programs which I mentioned are concerned, uh, it seems to me that this is one of the important areas in which uh, some of those programs uh, can be implemented and can help uh, these people. I would put them, uh, as I said, I would try to think of this as as not a program to help Negroes or help, Amer help uh, Mexicans or Italians or anybody else, but as something for all people in the same situation of uh, poverty and lack of education and so forth. I got time for about one more question, I think. Yeah. The question is, if Proposition 14 should pass, uh, there will be, s he questioner predicted, I think accurately, that there will be suits on constitutionality of it and whether or not the, question was whether or not the federal government would, would uh, take any, uh, any uh, role in that. Uh, I think the answer to that is uh, uh, no, at least not until it got to the United States Supreme Court. And at that point, whether or not we took a role, as a, I'm looking way out ahead on that, uh, would probably be influenced by whether or not the court asked us for our views. Certainly if the court asked the federal government for its views, as they sometimes do on constitutional questions, uh, I'm sure we would respond. Whether we would enter the case at that point, I would be, uh, be doubtful, but not want to regard this as a commitment one way or the other. I think that's just about ten of them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katzenbach, again. Thank you for your questions, and I invite you all back here Friday to hear Ray Bradbury speak. Thank you.